Welcome to this service at Faith and Victory Church. This is the place to come to receive your miracle from God. Now, let's join our service already in progress. Amen. You know, I was thinking about uh, verse of that song there about uh, reach out and receive. Take it now. You notice faith is never passive. <coughs> Put that in your pocket. That'll do you some good. Faith isn't passive. Faith takes. Faith seizes. You know, that's... I've heard uh, Glory Copeland talking about that, particularly with regard to healing and her healing messages, that you got to reach out and you got to grab it. It's yours. You don't have to be timid. You don't have to be afraid of, am I going to offend God? No, it's yours. Like the song says, it's ours Reach out and grab it. And that's what we have to do by faith. But that's not what I'm going to talk about. <laughs> I just thought about that while they were singing that song. Praise the Lord. Oh, it's just good anyway. That's right. It's just a little side journey. All right. Praise the Lord. Well, open your Bibles to Isaiah chapter 40. And as you do that, we'll go ahead and open in prayer. Father, we thank you for this opportunity to come and receive from your word. Your word is the manufacturer's manual for our lives. And so, Father, we read your word, we study your word, we meditate in your word so that we'll know how to live, how to act, what to do, what to say. We thank you for it in Jesus' name. Amen. Isaiah 40, and we're going to look at verse uh, 13. And as we're about to talk about this, let me just share with you a little bit about certain scriptures. <laughs> Certain scriptures, you know, you grab a hold of them. I know Philippians 4.19. For my God shall supply all my need according to his riches and glory by Christ Jesus. And it becomes kind of ingrained in you. It kind of becomes embedded in you. Part of, makes, it makes you who you are almost to think about certain things. Well, this scripture is one that was important to the Apostle Paul. We'll find out why that's true here in a minute. But Isaiah 40.13 who hath directed the Spirit of the Lord, or being his counselor, hath taught him? Now that's the King James. Who hath directed, measured out, this is the, the uh, Hebrew word here, talkan, means measured out to arrange, to equalize, the idea of leveling, to estimate. The Spirit of the Lord, the word spirit here is ruach, which is, you know, it almost sounds Klingon. I love that. <laughs> Yeah, Klingon, if you, if you ever read any Klingon, uh, they actually have a dictionary. And one of their favorite words is kapla, which means success. Well, ruach. <laughs> Sounds a Klingon to me. I'm sorry. It's just a, a little side note there. But at any rate, it is a word, though, that means the breath. It's the breath of God, the spirit of God. Ruach. Amen. I used to think it was Roush. That's the way I used to pronounce it. But I did a little study and found out it's ruach. Anyway, it's got that guttural sound. But it means wind by semblance of the breath. That is a sensible or even violent exhalation to breathe outward. Uh, figurative life, anger, unsubstantiability. Now there's a word for you. By extension, a region of the sky, by resemblance of the spirit, a rational being. The spirit is... A living being. And this is the Spirit of the Lord. Who has directed or put in order or instructed the Spirit of the Lord? And I believe Paul, I believe this has been a lot to him because we're going to go find out now from Romans chapter 11. Let's go to that. Romans chapter 11 and verse uh, 34. Scroll down here a good ways. Romans, now remember, Paul wrote Romans. Right? To the church at Rome. He said, For who hath known the mind of the Lord, or hath been, uh, who has been his counselor? In other words, he's quoting that scripture from Isaiah. I believe this scripture was important to Paul. I believe he saw something in this. And, I, you know, if you, if you study scripture, if you meditate on scripture, there's something called progressive revelation. That's a 
religious sounding term, but it's what it means is as you meditate on something, you get more information out of it, you pull more meaning out of it, it begins to minister to you in a very particular way. So here, uh, let's back up just a, a few verses here. Verse 32, For God hath concluded them all in unbelief that he might have mercy upon all. Oh, the depth of the riches both of the wisdom and knowledge of God. How unsearchable are his judgments, and his ways are past finding out. And then he quotes the scripture from Isaiah. For who has known the mind of the Lord, and who has been his counselor? So he quotes the scripture. Now we're going to go to another location where he quoted the scripture, 1 Corinthians chapter 2. And I want you to think about what I was talking about, about progressive revelation. 2 Corinthians chapter 2, and where are we going to start here? Uh, let's start verse 14, because that's a good place to start. Make sure I'm in the right place here. I am not. I'm in 2 Corinthians. 1 Corinthians chapter 2. I knew that didn't look right. You know, sometimes, particularly when you're clicking, that can happen. And by the way, I, once again, I want to recommend eSword. I love eSword. All right. Let's go from... Wow, boy. I've got to give you the whole background here. Let's just look at the chapter. You know, I like to look at it in context, so praise the Lord. 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 1, And I, brethren, when I came unto you, came not with excellency of speech and of wisdom, declaring unto you the testimony of God. From Paul's own testimony, his actual speaking presence was really not that profound. You know what I'm saying? He wasn't a great orator. Now, he was a great mind. He was a great intellect. He had a lot of training, a lot of education, and of course... The Holy Spirit used him tremendously. But when he came to preach, you know, that one time when he put the guy to sleep <laughs> and he fell out of the window and died and Paul had to raise him from the dead, I mean, the boy was not a, an order. Okay? All right. But let's keep reading here. He says, When I came to you, I came not with excellency of speech, the words I wasn't a great order, or of wisdom, declaring unto you testimony of God, for I determined not to know anything among you save or accept Jesus Christ and Him crucified. And I was with you in weakness, and in fear, and in much trembling. And my speech and my preaching was not with enticing words of man's wisdom. Okay? So he wasn't the great orator that spoke forth these great words that everybody just, oh, wow, look at him. No. But rather, he said, my speech and my preaching was not with enticing words of man's wisdom, but in demonstration of the Spirit and of power. He may not have had a, a great oratory, but boy, when he started laying hands on folks, miracles, signs, wonders began to happen. So he had the demonstration of the Spirit to enforce what he was saying. And it was no doubt that what he was saying was important. It was strong. It was valid. It was scriptural. But, you know, his natural presence didn't carry that across. Uh, let's see. Spirit of wisdom and of power, that your faith should not stand in the wisdom of men, but in the power of God. And that's really true today. I don't care how well people can speak publicly. If there's no demonstration of the Spirit and of power, and it's not God coming forth, it's just words. And it's just it's man's wisdom. How about we speak wisdom among them that are perfect, are mature, mature Christians, yet not the wisdom of this world, nor of the princes of this world that came to naught, but we speak the wisdom of God in a mystery, even the hidden wisdom which God has ordained before the world unto our glory, which none of the princes, and the word princes here is talking about, you know, Satan's operation in heavenly places, Satan's minions, if you will, none of the princes of this world knew, for had they known it, they would not have crucified the Lord of glory. See, God kind of fakes Satan out. You know, he had this plan for Jesus to bear all of the sin, all the sickness, all the disease, everything, take it all on him, and the only requirement was he had to go to the depths of hell because he, that way we didn't have to, okay? And it said that he, when he came back out of hell, he brought captivity captive with him. He brought a lot of people back up with him that believed him preaching the word of God. But, you know, and I heard Brother, Brother Copeland tell the story one time about an old truck driver that was listening to him talking about how Jesus went to hell 
to uh, you know, uh, take our punishment and so forth. And the old truck driver said, my Lord didn't go to hell. And he comes stomping down that middle aisle of the church. And Brother Copeland just stared him down and said, boy, if he didn't go, you would. <laughs> I thought, well, there you go, boldness. <laughs> this was a big guy. But and the guy kept coming back, and he finally saw it. He finally saw that that was scriptural, because there's plenty of scriptures that talk about that. I mean, even the book of Acts, where it talks about that he wouldn't leave his soul in hell. Well, that means it had to go there. Okay? And yet, that is a doctrine, believe it or not, that is a doctrine, a teaching from the Word of God that is actually very controversial outside of Word of Faith circles. And as a matter of fact, that's one of the reasons that people call Word of Faith teaching heretical. Oh, that can't be of God. They believe Jesus went to hell. Well, he did. Read your Bible. He did. And he brought captivity up with him when he came out. See, he did, God didn't leave him there. You know, I mean, they act like took Jesus to hell and just left him there. No. Jesus broke the chains and the bondage and came up out of hell uh, uh, successful in his efforts to take over uh, the things of Satan. But the point is, all of that was part of the plan. And had the princes of this world known it, they wouldn't have played their part in the plan which was taking Jesus to hell. So it's pretty slick, actually. But notice that this wisdom was not available to the world or to those princes over the world. Uh, let's go back and read it again, verse 8. Which none of the, the princes of this world knew, for had they known it, they would not have crucified the Lord of glory. But as it is written, I have not seen, nor ear heard, neither has it entered into the heart of man, the things which God hath prepared for them that love him. In other words, in the natural, you can't see into the things of God. That's going to be real important here in a moment. Verse 10. But God hath revealed them, these things that are of God, hath revealed them unto us by His Spirit, for the Spirit searches or knows all things, yea, even the deep things of God. The Holy Spirit knows the things of God. The natural man doesn't know the things of God. Demons, principalities, powers, they don't know the plan of God. Otherwise, they wouldn't have been fooled. See, a lot of Christians are giving Satan a whole lot more credit than he's due. They think he's all-knowing and all-powerful. No, that's God. God's all-knowing. God's all-powerful. God's omniscient. But the devil's not. He's just a spirit being, an angel, that fell, stripped all of his power away from him, Jesus then defeats him in hell, and it says, the scripture says that he is paralyzed, meaning he doesn't have power and authority unless we give it to him. How do we do that? With our tongue. You know those fiery darts that Satan likes to throw at tongues? There's a purpose behind that. He throws the thoughts and the schemes and the plans and the ideas at you to get you to say what he wants you to say, and your own authority through your words drags you down. Well, I'll just get sick like I always do this time of year. Well, guess what? Satan doesn't even have to lift a finger. Couldn't if he wanted to. He's paralyzed. But he's got you doing to you what he wants. Well, stop. <laughs> Don't let him do that. That's why we have the shield of faith which will stop how many of the fiery darts? All the fiery darts of the wicked one. So we're the ones, and we'll find out here in a minute how important this is, we're the ones that make the decision to act on the knowledge of the Word of God. All right, I'm getting ahead of myself. 1 Corinthians 2.12, We receive not the Spirit of the world, but the Spirit which is of God. Not the Spirit of the world, but the Spirit which is of God. Well, who's the Spirit which is of God? The Holy Ghost. The Spirit of God that we receive as a... Uh, first of all, He was present in our getting born again, absolutely. But we received Him with the baptism of the Holy Ghost, speaking in other tongues. The second experience where Jesus baptizes us in, in the Holy Ghost. In other words, the Holy Ghost is the medium by which we are baptized into. All right? For instance, if you're baptized in water, 
Somebody, the preacher usually, baptizes you in water. That is the medium into which you're baptized. Then he lifts you up, and you are now baptized in water. Well, if you're baptized in the Holy Ghost, the Holy Ghost is the medium into which you are baptized, and it says Jesus is the one who will baptize with the Holy Ghost and fire. So he's the one doing the baptizing. All right? I don't want to get too deep into all that, but the point is, we have the Spirit of God, and this scripture makes it plain, we've received not the Spirit of the world, but the Spirit which is of God, that we, why? That we might know the things that are freely given to us of God. Now, I'm going to misread this to make a point. We are given the Spirit of God that God might hold out on us and try to keep us from knowing the things of God. That's the way Christians believe it. That's not what it says. It says He freely gives us these, this information. He freely gives it to us. He wants us to have it. He doesn't want Satan to have it. He doesn't want the prince of this world to have it. But He wants us to have it. Okay? Again, going to be important in a minute. Which things also we speak, not in the words of man's wisdom, uh, which man's wisdom teacheth, but which the Holy Ghost, there he is, the Holy Ghost teacheth, comparing spiritual things with spiritual. Now verse 14. 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 14. This scripture will help you understand the world. The natural man receiveth not the things of the Spirit of God. Now I want you to think about that. An unborn again person out there in the world cannot receive the things, the wisdom, the information from God. Well, yeah, but Brother Bill, how does he get born again? Well, faith comes by hearing, hearing by the Word of God. You preach the Word, they hear the Word, it makes inroads into their spirit, they accept the free gift of salvation, and then they're born again and they qualify to get all these things for this information freely. But before that, they can't receive it. doesn't say they wouldn't receive it because they didn't want to. It says they can't receive it. Now, you know, I've got people I've talked to, Christians. I don't understand. I explain it to my family and they just don't get it. Well, the natural man can't understand the things of God. They think I'm crazy. Yes. They will. And they really will think you're crazy. I've had many people think that I'm crazy. I wear it like a badge. <laughs> but let's keep reading. The natural man receives not the things of the Spirit of God for their foolishness unto him. That's what I was talking about. They think it's foolish. Neither can they know them because... Why? Because they're spiritually discerned. A natural man has no spiritual discernment. He can't see into the things of God. It's like there's a barrier, you know, a smoke screen, if you will, that they just can't see spiritual things. And if you talk to them about things that you see from a spiritual perspective, that you understand, I mean, I've talked to folks, you know, and this is maybe this is a little controversial, but it's just the truth. I've talked to folks that talk about, well, you know, Christians shouldn't believe that people should be executed because we're supposed to walk in love and, and you know, so that there should never be any executions. We should march and we should say, no, we're not going to have anybody executed. Bunch of wimps. The Bible says in the Ten Commandments, thou shalt not kill, and actually the way you read that in Hebrew is, you shall not take innocent life. Well, <laughs> abortion is the most innocent life taking you can do. But even so, you can, you know, the people, these, these people will quote, oh, we'll see, we're not supposed to kill. No, we're not supposed to take innocent life. But if they're not innocent, if they're a murderer, what does the Bible say? The Bible says that the, the law does not bear the sword in vain. And the Bible makes it clear that capital punishment actually is legitimate if, they're, if it's not innocent life. And a lot of people say, yeah, but Dr. Bill, that's hard. That's not walking in love. Love 
should not be an excuse for breaking the law of God. Amen. And it's ooey-gooey, wishy-washy love anyway that people are talking about, not real love. You know, so people hear that and say, well, that can't be of God. And you know, there was a, <laughs> there was a thing many years ago, and I still see it every so often, where people would wear these little uh, bands around their arm that, what would Jesus do? What would Jesus do? And invariably, they would look at it from the natural perspective. What would Jesus do? Well, Jesus would just take care of everybody and, and, and you know, make sure that everybody was taken care of. The government should just take care of everybody and there should, nobody should have to work. Well, first of all, that's dumb. Because where are you going to get the money to take care of the people you know, that aren't working? Well, you're going to take it from the people that are working. All right, but even so, well, see, that's love. We're supposed to... The Bible says... If they don't work, they shouldn't eat. Wait a minute. Well, no, that's what it says. But that can't be of God. He wrote it in his Bible. <laughs> you know, I mean, the thing is, people will say, what would Jesus do? And then they attribute to Jesus all these crazy ideas. Now, what Jesus would do is what his word says. What Jesus would think is what his father said. Because that's all he ever did was what he saw his father do, what he heard his father say. He said, that was his testimony out of his own mouth. So if you want to know what would Jesus do, read the Bible. And I guarantee you most of these people with the, with the bracelets that are talking about, yeah, whatever, what Jesus would do. We ought to save the earth because of global warming because that's what Jesus would do. Jesus would be laughing his head off. You crazy people. <laughs> but the thing is, you know, they think they're doing what Jesus would do. But they can't see into spiritual things. Now, let's keep reading here. The natural man receives not the things of the Spirit of God for their foolishness to him, neither can he know them because they're spiritually discerned. But, verse 12, 15, but he that is spiritual... Now, if you're born again, filled with the Holy Ghost, guess what? You're spiritual. Oh, but Dr. Bell, I don't feel very spiritual. Well, you are. <laughs> Get over yourself, you are. <laughs> but he that is spiritual judges or understands all things, but he himself is understood or judged of no man. That's why people think you're crazy, because that's what the Bible said. <laughs> They're going to look at you, a spiritual person, and say, well, I don't, I don't think he, I think he's crazy. He's just out of his mind. Why? Because I believe the Bible. Literally, there are people who believe, if you believe the Bible, literally, then you're crazy. I've read articles out there on the internet. Well, anybody that believes the Bible's crazy. Why? Because of all the contradictions. Show me one, just one, that holds up when I study the whole Word of God and bring it back together and look at it. Show me one. I have been saying that now for... 35 years, four years probably, and nobody's taken me up on it yet. So, I mean, the Bible is consistent. God is consistent. So, he that is spiritual understands or judges all things, but he himself is understood or judged of no man. For, now notice he starts quoting that scripture, but here's where progressive revelation comes in. For who has known the mind of the Lord that he may instruct him, but we have the mind of Christ. Now there's a turn on that scripture. That's, we read earlier that who can know the mind of the Lord? Who can instruct the Lord? The obvious answer is, well, nobody. Man certainly can't. Natural man certainly can't. But look what he says here. He's requoting that scripture. Who has known the mind of the Lord that he may instruct him, but we have the mind of Christ. Now, from these scriptures, I can prove to anybody that's honest that mental telepathy cannot be legitimate. Because it says here, who can know the things of a man, the thoughts, the things of a man, save or accept the spirit of the man that's in him? That is a good enough scripture right there to say that I can't know what Dick's thinking. 
and he can't know what I'm thinking. He, in his mind and his spirit, he is the only one that can know, other than God, obviously. But, with, but from man to man situation here, I can't really know what he's thinking. I might make some educated guesses, but I can't know. And he can't know what I'm thinking. He may make some educated guesses, but he can't know. But guess what? God knows what he thinks, right? Jesus knows what God thinks. Amen? Said whatever he sees the Father do, he does. Whatever he hears the Father say, he says it. So he obviously knows what the Father thinks. I mean, the Trinity is the Trinity for a reason. God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Ghost. They are a Trinity, but they are one. So they know what they're thinking. And then we see that nobody can know the things of the, of the spirit of a man except that man. But we have the mind of Christ. We have the mind of Christ. So therefore, I can know what God's thinking. I can know what Jesus is thinking because they're one. I have the mind of Christ. Well, Dr. Bill, then surely we just all know the, the mind of God and we just do that all the time. Well, Proverbs 23, 7 says, For as a man thinks in his heart, so is he. As you think, so are you. Philippians 2, 5 says, Let this mind be in you, which also was in Christ Jesus. What's the word let mean? Let means you've got to allow it. So yes, we have the mind of Christ. Do we always react and do and think what Jesus is thinking? No, because we've got to let the mind of Christ work in us. And as you think in your heart, so are you. So if we will actually let or allow the mind of Christ to work in us, then we can actually begin to operate like we were reading there, where we know what God's thinking. Now, the only way to really get good at this, get good at letting the mind of Christ work in you, is read the Word. Because he put all his thoughts, all his knowledge into the Word. And he gave it to us for the purpose of training and education and mind renewal. Matter of fact, let's go over to Romans chapter 12. I beseech or beg you, brethren, this is Paul again talking to the Romans, I beg you, brethren, by the mercies of God that you present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable or spiritual service, and be not conformed to the world. If he has to tell us, be not conformed to the world, then is it possible for us to be conformed to the world? <laughs> Unfortunately, yeah. That's why he has to tell us, be not conformed to the world, but be transformed, metamorphosized by the renewing of your mind. You renew your mind to the Word of God. That you may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will. And remember, the will of God is the Word of God. The Word of God is the will of God. So we could actually exchange that and say, the Word of God. God's Word is acceptable. God's Word is perfect. God's Word is good. So it qualifies. So we have to renew our mind to the Word of God. If we'll renew our mind to the Word of God, then we're hearing what God is saying. Like Jesus said, whatever my Father says, that's what I say. Whatever I see Him do, that's what I'll do. We look at what Jesus is doing in the New Testament. We read how He operated, what He did, and we act that way. We do what He did. Now again, that's very controversial in some circles. I say, oh, try to act like Jesus. Well, Jesus said, the things that I do shall you do also, and greater things than these shall you do, Christians. So it's not blasphemous for me to say I'm going to do what Jesus did. I mean, everybody's got the little thing about what would Jesus do band we were talking about earlier. Well, <laughs> put another one on the other arm that says I'm going to do what Jesus does. <laughs> And what would he do? I'm going to do it. Amen. So do what Jesus would do. Operate by faith. Lay hands on the sick and watch them recover. Speak the word of God boldly. And when you do that, you'll find that you're becoming more conformed 
Not to the world, but to the Word of God. Not to the world, but to God Himself. And as we're conformed to Him, we let the mind of Christ be in us. That's how we allow Him to live through us. It's how we allow Him to do His work through us. I used to hear as a Baptist growing up, <laughs> we're God's hands and feet here on the earth. And I always used to think, well, bless His heart. <laughs> you don't have to put up with us being His hands and feet. But the thing of it is, what I didn't know as a Baptist was that He equipped us. He gave us the power. He gave us the anointing. He gave us His Word. He gave us the mind of Christ. So if we begin to act on those capabilities, we can act like Jesus acts. We can do what Jesus does. And we'll begin to think like He thinks. And I didn't give the title. I usually do give the title of the message before I get started. But we have the mind of Christ. We don't have to earn the mind of Christ. It's not something we'll get one day. We have the mind of Christ now. But we have to let it operate in us. So, let's go back to, uh, to that scripture. Let this mind be in you. Philippians 2.5. Philippians chapter 2, verse 5. I'm going to go back up and put it in context. Again, I like context. Philippians 2, 1. If there therefore be any consolation in Christ, if any comfort of love, if any fellowship of the Spirit, any bowels and mercies, fulfill ye my joy that you be like-minded, having the same love, being of one accord and one mind. What mind? The mind of Christ. Fulfill ye my joy that ye be like-minded, having the same love, being one accord and of one mind. Let nothing be done through strife or vainglory, but in lowliness of mind, let each esteem other better than themselves. Look not every man on his own things, but every man also on the things of others. Let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus. Let this mind be in you which was also in Christ Jesus, who, being in the form of God, thought it not robber to be equal with God, but made himself of no reputation, and took upon him the form of a servant, and was made in the likeness of men, and being found in, the fa in fashion as a man, he humbled himself and became obedient unto death, even the death of the cross. Wherefore God hath highly exalted him, and given him a name which is above every name. That at that name, at the name of Jesus, every knee should bow, of things in heaven, things in earth, and things under the earth. And every tongue should confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Wherefore, my beloved, as you have always obeyed, not as in my presence only, but now much more in my absence, work out your own salvation with fear and trembling. First time I read that scripture, I went, work out my own salvation? I thought salvation wasn't the works. <laughs> That's not what he's talking about. It's actually maybe a better way of putting it is work within your salvation. You are born again, but work within that. Learn about what God's given you in this life of salvation that we walk in. See, salvation wasn't getting your ticket punched just so you go to heaven. You became a new creature in Christ Jesus. You're now the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus. You are now a child of God and can say, Abba, Father. So you're different than you were just by being born again. Yeah, I got my ticket punch, going to heaven. Well, good for you, but you are now a different person. You now have access to the mind of Christ. You now can begin to operate in the world for God's pleasure and benefit and plan, not your own. That goes back to where it says there, you know, don't look at your own things. Yeah, I'm looking at my things. I got my car, I got my motorcycle, I got this, I got that. I got my own things. Well, don't look to those. Look to the things of others. Bless them. Meet their needs. Get them healed. Get them blessed. Amen. You be a conduit for God and work within your salvation to be a blessing. So we have the mind of Christ. We have the Word of God. We have His thoughts and His plans. 
We have everything we need. And we have the Spirit of God to empower us and to anoint us to do His work. So now we should let or allow His mind to work in us and begin to go out and do what He's called us to do. You've got a calling on your life. Well, yeah, but I'm not called to the five-fold ministry. Some of you might be, but if you're not, you're still called as a minister of reconciliation. The Word of God talks about every believer is called to reconcile, help tell the world that they're reconciled to God. You know, that's an amazing thing. The world is already, through Jesus, reconciled to God. Now, that's not an automatic rubber stamp they're going to heaven, but it means all they got to do is receive it. It's a free gift. So, tell them. You're reconciled to God if you'll just accept what Jesus did for you. And once they do that, they become a conduit for the will of God in the earth, just like you are. And we just keep multiplying. I mean, <laughs> we just keep getting out there and getting in Satan's business, taking over. You know, I, I, I remember the first time I heard the Scripture talk about the gates of hell shall not prevail against the church. And like a lot of good Baptists, I took that as, you know, Satan's just beat me in the head with that gate. <laughs> but it's not going to prevail against the church, no matter how hard he beats me. That's not what it's talking about. The gates of hell should not prevail means we're rushing the gates. We're on an offensive. We're taking back territory. The gates of hell won't prevail against the church. Why? Because we're rushing them. We're taking territory back, which means we're getting folks born again, getting them into the kingdom. And Satan's going, man, I lost another one. Oh, I lost another one. Oh, I lost another one. He's getting irritated. Well, good. I like it when he's irritated. Just makes my day. So you begin to see the treasure, the blessing, the wonder of salvation. A lot of us just haven't gotten it, haven't understood it, that we're really, really different beings than we were before we got born again. New creatures in Christ Jesus. Totally different unlike anything that's ever existed before. I mean, first time Satan saw a believer, can you imagine? He went, what in the world happened to that? I mean, he was dark. He was full of darkness. He was one of my people. And then all of a sudden, bam, he's full of light. The anointing of God's flowing out of it. What am I going to do? He's going to lose big time. Hallelujah. Well, we didn't go for an hour and a half. I'm trying to get better about that. But, uh, so praise the Lord. But did you get anything out of this? We have the mind of Christ. We need to allow that mind of Christ to function within us. Praise the Lord. We trust that you were blessed by the Word of God and the flow of the Spirit of God in this service. If you would like to contact us, please write us via email at office at fbc.org or using our mailing address, P.O. Box 7752, Greensboro, North Carolina, 27417. If you would like to contribute to our ministry, please go to our website at www.fbc.org and click on the Giving Online button. Thank you, and may God richly bless you for your giving.